My dad, he was an alcoholic, but he was a very brilliant guy, a very smart guy. My mom was killed in a car accident the night before my third birthday, but I didn't even have a picture of her until I was in my 30s or 40s. I didn't know what she looked like. I didn't know anything about her. I didn't have one memory, not one. You had a twitch and sometimes they'd peel and then they would, they would whip you and you'd have whelps on you. So you learned. He would say, you, should, you can throw the Bible in the fire. You don't need to go through anybody to talk to God, talk to him yourself. So they just kind of took us and they put my brother and my older, one of my, and my sister in an orphanage and they put three of us in one home. After we were in this foster care and the lady would beat us and all that, I remember she was, there was a, uh, across the street, there was a street and across the street there was a corn, there was a, a barbed wire fence with cows behind it and the lady said, don't cross the street. She said, because if you touch the barbed wire fence, it'll kill you. And I knew my mom was dead. And I said, I want to go with my mom. I'm a three-year-old. I want to be with my mom. Well, your mom's dead. And don't do that or you'll die. So in my little three-year-old, four-year-old mind, I thought, if I can just get across that street and just grab that, f that fence, I can go be with my mom. And so I watched out um, for a period of time and eventually was able to sneak across the street and put my hand on that five-bar fence. And this is, but the brain is smarter than I was because it won't do it. It, will, it, you know, it, it takes its hands off. But I have these little you know, you know, memories. That lady put my sister, I have a sister that was younger. I'm three. Linda was four. Lois was one. The two-year-old went someplace else. So somehow my sister went to another place she wasn't with us. But they stood my one-year-old sister who had, had pooped in her pants. They stood her in a big metal tub outside in the yard. And they pumped water from an outside pump on her. And she was screaming and crying. And I was trying to push the lady away and um, stop her from hurting my sister. So you see, I grew up with all of these well-meaning, seemingly religious folks. And of course, I'm sure there's some of my father's history in there, but I had my own experiences that people say one thing and they do another. My sister Betty was the one that went to live with the other people. My dad got her back. He, he got us, because I used to tell the lady, my dad's gonna come get me, my dad's gonna come get me. She said, they don't come back. And I said, yes, he is. And I'm like, he's coming back. And I remember sitting and looking out the window and it would be raining and I'd be crying. I'm like, I know he's coming back. He's coming back to get us. And um, I used to go out, there was this weeping willow tree. And uh, I used to sit under this weeping willow tree and uh, just pray to die, you know, or just go and something. But eventually my dad came and got us back and he picked up my sister, Betty, who, who was at another house now. Evidently, they really loved her there because they, she had all these stuffed animals and the people were crying when she left and all of that. And so he loaded us up and he went to visit his sister in Aiken, South Carolina. I mean, in Augusta, Georgia. Now, my dad had just got us back now. So I'm sitting there and my dad is um, talking to his sister, Lainey, Aunt Lainey, and he, she says, Scotty, she said, you know, I wasn't able to have any kids. She had one kid, and I think it died at birth or died at one, you know. And she said, you know, I don't have any kids. Give me one of yours. And you know what he said? She said, you know, I don't have any kids. Give me one of yours. And you know what he said? He said, which one? You know, like a piece of fruit. And so they picked my sister, Betty. And even though we had been separated and she was uh, the next one in age to me, down low, uh, uh, younger, but she was also the one most like me. One with the round cheeks and um, she was fair skinned and, um, my aunt was very fair, and um, we started to leave, I guess, a day or so later, and he loads the rest of us in the vehicle, and Betty's not with us. I kind of forgot about that, and so we're driving off, and I said, you forgot Betty, you forgot Betty, you forgot Betty, and he said, shut up and sit down, you know? And then she realized, and she's running down the street behind us, crying, saying, wait. Wow, 
we keep going and she just stops and my aunt puts her arm around her and takes her in the house and I always tell her, you lucked out because you didn't have to live in those fields. She said, but you know, you don't understand. She said, you had each other. I said, I would have traded with you. She said, no, you wouldn't. She said, you say that, but you guys grew up having each other. You knew your sister, your tough times were tough. She said, but you had each other. And she said, once Aunt Lainey died, you know, and Uncle Roosevelt wasn't very nice to her. I think he pulled a gun on her or something like that. And the money my aunt had saved for her to go to college, he wouldn't give it to her. And so she just joined the military. I always had the question why there's so many religions. It was interesting, I didn't care to impress anybody. I mean, and I got baptized three times now. I went from this church and they said, well, were you dunked, where you did this, you did that. I'm like, okay, keep doing it. Because I was expecting like the heavens to open up and angels to sing. I expected some phenomenal, something was supposed to happen and it didn't. And I still saw all these hypocrites saying one thing, doing another. How you were born doesn't mean have to be the way you die. Your parents will give you what they have, but that may not be all that there is to have. I could have seen my reality as being in fields the rest of my life and, and, and taken the picture or the vision that people had of me, but I always dreamed bigger. I was like, this is me, I'm not doing this. grew up in upstate New York and as I said we would travel up and down the eastern seaboard picking everything from string beans to digging potatoes cutting grapes we'd end up in Florida picking the oranges and tangerines and grapefruit and then we would travel back up the seasons and we would be because I was born in upstate New York we would end in New upstate New York where I grew up in Lyons Clyde New York area very close to Seneca Falls so if you understand the history of the women's movement in America Seneca Falls where Susan B. Anthony and all of them had the women's convention, and I lived very close to that area. I didn't know all of that, though. I mean, I think they showed us that, you know, we saw, you know, they take us to Philly, you know, trips and stuff, but I didn't realize how historical that space was. I'm a migrant worker still. We lived um, in an old farmhouse that didn't have running water. Even though people had it around us, my dad always, you know, didn't have a lot of money. So we lived in this old far farmhouse and we had to chop wood for heat. We had to pump water to, and take the water and, and put it on the stove. And we had one of these old fashioned stoves where there's a little thing that you put in there and it lifts up the little round plate and you would put the wood underneath there. And we would heat the water, uh, boiling it, and pour it in the tub, and so we would wash in the tub. We didn't have an indoor bathroom, so we had buckets that we had to take to an outhouse. This is, what, this is that environment I grew up in as a teenager, as a little girl, at, between that and the field. So when people talk about slavery, I really empathize because when we were doing the migrant work, we stayed in those hovels. We would go into these places where these dirt floor shacks and live there for a month or so at a time and just work the fields and work the fields and work the fields. You live in these hovels and you work your butt off. I mean, you're in the field when the sun comes up. So when people say, how do you do what you do now? Because I never had a choice it, I, I wasn't raised to stop when I was tired. That's actually my goal now. Stop, Barbara, you can rest. You know, that's why I write poems like Superwoman doesn't live here anymore. Superwoman doesn't live here anymore. Last seen wandering aimlessly on some far and distant shore. She was so busy attending to this and that, I don't think even she knew where she was at and she kept trying to handle more and more. Seems she lost all track of what life is for. When I saw her last, she looked haggard and worn for doing for others or feeling the scorn, buying for others when her own clothes were worn, repeating this cycle every sundown and morn. No, Superwoman doesn't live here anymore. 
We made her leave. She was getting neurotic. Her life was too busy, too hectic, too chaotic. Superwoman seems to come and go. I don't think her vocabulary contains the word no. So one day she left without a warning or cry, without a sermon or a party or a single goodbye. No, Superwoman doesn't live here anymore. The lady here now still minds the store. She gets lots of help, she has time for fun, she does what she can and she leaves the rest undone. And it's not that the lady doesn't care, <laughs> she's just content with doing her share. She went to work, earned a promotion, so the dishes aren't done, what's a commotion? She realizes there isn't time for everything, so she decides what she can do. Sometimes it's her business, sometimes it's her house, sometimes it's her kids, sometimes it's her spouse. Sometimes it's cleaning and cooking and shopping at the mall. And every now and then, she seems to do it all. You see, Superwoman was everything to everybody. She attended to all needs but her own. The lady here now used to be a Superwoman, but oh, how much I've grown. No, Superwoman doesn't live here anymore. You see, Superwoman doesn't know how to live. No, Superwoman, no. That poem I wrote just to tell my friends, my sisters, and all the women I ran into is like, you are not a superwoman. You can't, you know, leap tall buildings with a single bound like the Superman commercial. You have to take some time out and pray and say no and put the kids first and the family because the, there's some things you don't get a do-over. But this thing of mothers being able to say no without guilt uh, kind of led me to one of the poems that I wrote called Superwoman Doesn't Live Here Anymore. And then it became a, uh, a workshop, and then it became a book. So I wrote this poem years ago because I was being pulled in so many directions. I was being pulled in my job. You can get overwhelmed because the society wants you to be perfect at everything. They want you to be the perfect mother, the, you know, the, the perfect wife. You gotta look like you just walked out of a magazine like they do on TV all the day. Your house is that, you home cook food. What they're telling mothers to do is really, it's, it's impossible to have all of these full-time jobs and do all of them perfectly. And what we have to learn to do is, learn to realize is that we're not perfect and we can't do them all perfectly. But one thing I've learned is that with motherhood, you don't get a do-over. Some things you can let go, you can do later. Like I said, I'm gonna do some television. In 2011, I went out and interview, interviewed with Oprah's producers about some stuff. I really wasn't ready to go at that point because my daughter's still in high school but I'm gonna look them up, you know, in a few years. You know, I'm gonna do some local television. I'd started my own business in 1987. I was teaching, a different, I was teaching about 10 different software packages, so I was a techie. Um, before that, I had been a programmer for years. And then in the, in the late 80s and 90s, uh, in the late 80s and 90s, I moved into diversity, leadership, time management, goal setting, all that kind of stuff. And so that's why I've, I've written all the books. Just like my father wrote, I wrote a lot of poetry in order to find myself. So we lived in this place, we chopped wood, we, you know, did the outhouse thing. My father was so thrifty. I have an interesting relationship with my dad, unlike the first eight and the first 12, or any of the others really. I mean, maybe two, they all hated my dad. They saw him as just evil. They didn't, you know, they would curse his name, you know, even when he was dead, not to his face, but. <laughs> but um, I just saw, I guess because we were both poets. I, what do you do with that pain? You see, in life, it's like driving a car. You're gonna drive forward, or you're gonna keep looking in your rearview window. If you keep looking in your rearview window all the time and not looking where you're going, you're gonna run into something, you see. Or you're gonna miss a whole lot. I've chosen not to miss life.
As I said, my father was a writer. And so when I've become very, very upset, and I've been upset many times. The first job I tried to go to get in upstate New York, they told me I wanted to work at the bank. They said, we don't hire black folks. The first apartment I went to, they slammed the door and said the apartment's rented. And I went to the phone booth. We had phone booths back then, we didn't have cell phones. And I called and I said, I'm sorry, I've been detained. Is it possible to look at the apartment later? She said, oh, come whenever you want. She didn't think black people could say detained, you know. Guess she want me to speak like the people with talking in the South. Those people that they look down on condescendingly like my stepmother. When you have people who, who were forbidden to learn, her parents were not allowed to learn. So the language they spoke, the broken English, the Ebonics that people have the audacity to laugh at and look, at, look down on condescendingly was all they had. And here it was, their lives were stolen. Their entire lives were stolen. So my father, he wrote when things didn't make sense. And somehow I picked that up. And so I saw my father, I couldn't hate my father because people are the products of their environment. You put them next to some bad apples, they become bad, you put them in good environments. Some people have so many more opportunities than other people. And you only have one choice. You're gonna love or you're gonna hate. Both of those can't occupy the same space. But what I have done is in, in, in fact in upstate New York, Years ago, I, was, I came face to face with the Klan. You know, you're familiar with the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan. They put on white things and they burn crosses in front of black people's homes and terrorize them and do all kind of stuff. Christianity told me I was born a sinner. You're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner. Negro, the N word. They were saying all kinds of things. We're like, if we're gonna have a label, let's choose it. I don't actually have any pictures of me as a kid. I mean, I started one side looking like that and I handed it to her and I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm in trouble. One day, I climbed up the ladder and it fell. Thought, finally, I'll get a day off from work. So I laid there and moaned. Oh, oh. I, I didn't talk about my story because every time I would start to talk, my body would like shake.